Good evening to those of you here and hello to viewers watching at home. On Friday, April 22nd of this year, 2022, Earth Day, Wynne Bruce, a climate activist and Buddhist practitioner, died after setting fire to himself on the steps of the United States Supreme Court. In 2018, David Buckle, a lawyer and environmental advocate, also cremated in Prospect Park, Brooklyn, New York. Although the actions of Bruce and Buckle seem to be inspired in part by Buddhist auto cremators of the late 20th and early 21st centuries, Buddhist self-immolation has a long history in East Asia. I would like to explore with you today some of the deeper historical connections between Buddhist self-immolation and climate change. In keeping with my usual practice, I'm going to use the term self-immolation for acts of self-sacrifice in which the body in part or as a whole is given up by various means. And I'll use auto cremation for the intentional destruction of the body by fire. Now, before we get too far, I should make it clear that self-immolation by Buddhists is statistically rare. We know of a few hundred cases over the last 1700 years, and it's also controversial within the Buddhist tradition. While some learned monks have written in defense of the practice, there are many voices within the tradition that are critical of self-immolation. It is very difficult to reconstruct the motivations of autochromators. This is especially true for historical actors, but remains the case even for contemporary figures. I do not know either of the people I just named and my knowledge of their lives. Uh, this. The slide is now not advancing. Okay. So <laughs> now we have technical issues here. Okay. I do not know either of the people I just named, and my knowledge of their lives and deaths comes only from what is publicly available in the media. I can therefore offer no deep or informed insight into how Mahayana Buddhist notions of abandoning the body or the significance of extreme giving on the Bodhisattva path played into the actions of Wynne Bruce and David Buckle. We can say, I think, that their actions and perhaps motives also seem to match well with the definition of suicide protest proposed by the sociologist Michael Biggs, who has made extensive studies of modern forms of political autochromation around the world. The cases of Wynne Bruce and David Buckle conform to the four criteria for suicide protest laid out by Biggs. One, the individual intentionally kills herself or himself or inflicts injury likely to cause death. Two, the individual does not intend to harm another or cause material damage. Three, the act is conducted in a public place and or accompanied by a statement addressed to policymakers or the general public. Four, the indicated cause for the act is a collective one rather than a personal grievance. David Buckle actually uses the term suicide protest in his final communication to the world, while at the same time indexing Tibetan Buddhist auto cremators of the early 21st century. I think it's likely that we will see more examples of suicide protest directed at the collective cause of the climate emergency but what role Buddhism may play in those suicides seems difficult to determine at this point. Well, let's see what we know about the cases of Bruce and Buckle. Earlier this year, on April 22nd, when Alan Bruce set himself on fire in the plaza of the US Supreme Court building in Washington, DC. Bruce was an American climate activist from Boulder, Colorado. He practiced Shambhala Buddhism. By early 2022, warnings that humanity is now facing a climate emergency were increasing, not only in the form of reports, raising the alarm about the need for immediate action to mitigate the worst effects of climate change, but also in climate related natural disasters. Colorado, where Wynne Bruce lived, experienced its most destructive ever wildfire in December 2021, and its three largest ever wildfires in 2020. 
In February of this year, the United States Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case of West Virginia versus the Environmental Protection Agency. And there were indications that the court could rule against the EPA's ability to regulate carbon dioxide emissions. There were other issues on the court's docket that were relevant to climate change and the environment. For years prior to his death, Wynne Bruce used his Facebook account to share his concerns about the climate emergency. In October 2020, he shared a link to an online course about climate change. He subsequently added comments to that link several times, adding the numbers 411 in April 2021, a fire emoji on October 21st, and on April 2nd of this year, he posted the date 4-22-2022. In January of this year, Bruce posted an image of the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who had passed away on January 22nd. He later commented on that post with a quotation he attributed to Thich Nhat Hanh. The most important thing in response to climate change is to be willing to hear the sound of the Earth's tears through our own bodies. Bruce's posts to Facebook were the only public indication that his autocremation was intended as a response to the climate emergency. In the early morning of April 22nd this year, Wynne Bruce arrived on foot at the plaza of the US Supreme Court. He silently sat down and set himself alight, remaining seated upright for about 60 seconds until police officers extinguished the flames. He was airlifted to hospital soon after and died of his injuries the following day. David Strobuckle was an American lawyer who worked on LGBTQ rights and was also an environmental activist. At around 6 a.m. on April 14, 2018, aged 60, he set himself on fire in Prospect Park near his home in Brooklyn, New York. An eyewitness called emergency services who arrived at 6.08. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Just a few minutes prior to his act, he'd emailed a statement to several US media outlets, which included these words. Most humans on the planet now breathe air made unhealthy by fossil fuels, and many die early deaths as a result. My early death by fossil fuel reflects what we are doing to ourselves. Near to the site of his death, Buckle had left a lanyard with his identification and a shopping cart with a plastic bag containing his business card, a copy of his suicide note, and another note apologizing for the mess. The area around him was burned in a perfect circle, perhaps because he had made a ring of soil in order to prevent the flames from spreading. Buckle had a long-standing interest in Buddhism and his statement to the media, which is several pages long, alluded to recent acts of autocremation by Tibetan Buddhists. How are we to understand what Bruce and Buckle did and what, if anything, is Buddhist about their deaths? Although there, was, there are certainly proximate examples of auto-cremation by Buddhists, I think we have to go back further than the recent wave of Tibetan Buddhist auto-cremators. The manner and intended impact of Bruce and Buckle's actions can better be traced back nearly 60 years to one act of auto-cremation by a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. This highly mediated event decisively impacted the nature of suicide protest around the world and continues to be the visual touchstone for autocremation as a political act. In 1963, Buddhist resistance to the government of Nord Dinh Diem, then president of South Vietnam, and backed by the government of the United States, was gaining momentum. On May 8th, Diem's forces shot and killed eight Buddhist demonstrators in the city of Hue. Hue was Diem's hometown, but the city was also an important Buddhist center. In early May, Diem visited Hue to celebrate Nordin Tuck's 25th anniversary as Catholic Archbishop. 
In honor of his brother's visit, Tuck had the yellow and white flags of the Vatican flying in the streets. When the Buddhists were banned from flying their own flags in honor of the Buddha's birthday, they staged large scale street demonstrations. Soon, one woman and seven children lay dead, apparently shot by government forces deployed against the demonstrators. By May 28th, the protests had moved to Saigon. Buddhists went on hunger strike and on June 5th, government forces injured 60 Buddhist protesters in Hue. At 9 a.m. on June 11th, a procession of monks set off from Xialoi Pagoda in Saigon, carrying signs denouncing Diem's regime. The demands of the Buddhist movement centered on the following five points. The Diem regime should one, lift its ban on flying the traditional Buddhist flag, two, grant Buddhism the same rights as Catholicism, three, stop detaining Buddhists, four, give Buddhist monks and nuns the right to practice and spread their religion. Five, pay full compensation to the families of those who had been killed in Hue and punish those responsible for their deaths. Four monks traveling in a gray car led the procession. At a busy intersection, the car stopped and one of the monks took a five gallon container of petrol from beneath the bonnet. It's perhaps worthy of note here that the use of modern fuels made auto cremation a much more rapid affair than it had been prior to the 20th century. The monk, Tik Kang Duk, who was then 67, senior and respected member of the Sangha, sat in the lotus position on a small brown cushion in the middle of the intersection. The fuel was poured over him. He lit a match and went up in flames, burning for five minutes until his body finally fell over. The American photographer Malcolm Brown continued to take pictures which were later seen around the world and continue to be the best known images of Buddhist auto cremation. The print media in the United States represented the eminent monks auto cremation as part of the story of religious persecution in Vietnam, a country in which the majority Buddhist population was ruled by a very small and intolerant Catholic clique. On June 27, 1963, a prominent group of American religious leaders published a full page advertisement in the New York Times entitled, We Too Protest. It featured the now world famous photograph of Kang Duk, which the New York Times had not published in its original report and called for support for the Vietnamese Buddhists. Auto cremation during the Vietnam War did not end with a spectacular death of Thich Hang Duc. Another six Buddhists burned themselves to death during the 1963 crisis, including one monk who rather pointedly did so in front of the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Saigon. And even more Buddhist monks set themselves ablaze in subsequent years. The sixth monk to burn himself on October 5th, 1963, was filmed doing so by NBC News. It was Thich Nhat Hanh, the monk so respected by Wynne Bruce, writing many years later, and for an audience that was not familiar with Vietnamese Buddhism, who conflated protest against the persecution, the quest for peace, and the path of the Christ-like Bodhisattva. He wrote, by burning himself, Thich Kang Duc awakened the world to the suffering of the war and the persecution of the Buddhists. When someone stands up to violence in such a courageous way, a force for change is released. Every action for peace requires someone to exhibit the courage to challenge the violence and inspire love. Love and sacrifice always set up a chain reaction of love and sacrifice. Like the crucifixion of Jesus, Thich Kang Duk's act expressed the unconditional willingness to suffer for the awakening of others. Whatever the 67-year-old monk had intended by his auto cremation, the effect far outlasted the immediate situation of 1963. His act has long since been extricated from the environment of resistance to DM's pro-Catholic policies and reinterpreted in multiple other contexts. 
There's no evidence that Kang Duk intended to protest against the war in Vietnam or thought that his death could bring peace. His was an act direct, directed against a specific regime that was repressing Buddhism through specific policies. In the immediate aftermath, his intention was understood both in Vietnam and in the United States as an act of political protest. As the situation in Vietnam changed after the overthrow of the Diem family and the increased involvement of US forces in the war, the strategy of autocremation was applied to anti-war protest. Kang Duk's autocremation, which provided the most spectacular and widely reproduced image of self-immolation, was now reinterpreted as the prime example of self-immolation for peace. We should bear in mind then that autocremation itself has no fixed meaning, Buddhist or otherwise. It is dependent on context and interpretation. Kang Duk's autocremation had significant immediate impact within South Vietnam. Suicide protests continued through the 1960s and 70s until Buddhist monasteries were completely suppressed after unification. And more significantly for us, Kang Duk's highly mediated action added autocremation to the repertoires of global protest. The photograph of a Buddhist monk seated in the lotus position consumed by flames became almost the default image for suicide protest. Most people who know the image could not name the monk in it. Michael Biggs, the sociologist, has compiled the figures and found that compared to the period 1919 to 1962, the annual rate of suicide protest was 17 times higher in the period 1963 to 1970. If figures for South Vietnam are excluded, the annual rate was still eight times higher. Autocremation now became the preferred method of suicide protest. Suicide protests prior to 1963 had used other means of death. But after Kang Duk's autocremation in 1963, 85% of individuals have burned themselves to death. The autocremation of a Vietnamese Buddhist monk thus had a decisive influence on suicide protest in the 20th and 21st centuries, but it's also the bridge to the deeper history of Buddhist self-immolation in East Asia. Kang Duk was a deeply learned monk, an expert in Vinaya, a devotee of the Lotus Sutra, and fully aware of the precedents for his act within the tradition. Looking at the historical records of Chinese Buddhism from the late fourth century to his own day, he would have read accounts of several hundred monks, nuns, and lay people who made offerings of their own bodies for a variety of reasons and in different ways. Buddhist self-immolators came from across the spectrum of the Sangha in China. They were Chan masters, distinguished scholars, preachers, wonder workers, and ascetics. They often ended their lives in front of large audiences. Officials of state, and sometimes even rulers themselves, witnessed the final moments, interred the sacred remains, and composed eulogies that extolled their acts. The act of burning the body in particular was frequently a dramatically staged spectacle, and its performance and remembrance took a strong hold on the Chinese Buddhist imagination. When we examine the representations of self-immolators in the sources, we discover that self-immolation, rather than being an aberrant practice, was commonly understood as a bodily path to awakening and ultimately to birth. Abandoning the body, to use a common term from the sources, featured not just the mode of autocremation, but also a range of other extreme acts, feeding one's body to insects, slicing off one's flesh, burning one's fingers or arms, burning incense on the skin, not all of which necessarily result in death, and starving, slicing or drowning oneself, leaping, leaping from cliffs or trees, feeding the body to wild animals, and self-mummification. Autocremation as a mode of self-immolation seems to have been a Sinitic Buddhist creation which first appeared in late 4th century China. It was probably not a continuation or adaptation of an Indian practice, but constructed on Chinese soil. Chinese Buddhist autocremation drew on a range of ideas, such as a particular interpretation of an Indian text, the Lotus Sutra, which features the autocremation of the Bodhisattva Medicine King, and indigenous traditions, such as burning the body to bring rain, 
which long predated the arrival of Buddhism in China. In China, auto cremation became a practice that was accessible to Buddhists of all kinds and was part of a serious attempt to make bodhisattvas on Chinese soil. Tikang Duk was conversant not just with the scriptural sources for self-immolation, he chanted the Lotus Sutra every day, but also with the historical details of Chinese auto cremators who had gone before him. Much of our historical data about auto cremation is preserved in collections of the genre known as biographies of eminent monks. Biographies in these collections were commonly based on the funerary inscriptions composed for their subjects. Self-immolation as a defined practice remains a somewhat elastic category that's not very well articulated in the individual biographies of self-immolators. And the compilers of biographical collections also took rather a circumspect approach to the topic. Biographers often represented individual acts of self-immolation as if they were predicated on a literal reading of certain texts, particularly tales of the past, such as Jatakas and Abhadanas, that often feature gifts of the body made by Shakyamuni in previous lives. And of course, the Lotus Sutra. Attempts to imitate those scriptural models are not unreasonable in the context. In the Mahayana literature especially, Chinese Buddhists were presented with the blueprints for turning ordinary beings into advanced bodhisattvas. And those blueprints stressed it repeatedly and explicitly that such acts of extreme generosity were, were a necessary part of the process. The bodhisattva, we learn, has to dis surrender dispassionately his own body and even his loved ones long before he reaches awakening. Chinese Buddhists read stories of Prince Mahasattva, who fed his body to a hungry tigress, King Shibi, who gave away his eyes, and Prince Chandraprabha, who gave his blood and marrow to cure a leper, or chopped off his own head and offered it to an evil Brahmin. There are many more examples. These extraordinary heroes are presented in a matter-of-fact manner as paradigms of true generosity. But these were not just fairy tales. Chinese Buddhists were acutely aware that these and similar precious teachings had emerged from the golden mouth of the Buddha himself. They could point to many places in the sutras where the Buddha said more or less explicitly, instructed them to do what they or the compatriots did with such enthusiasm. Buddhist self-immolators were said to have preserved the Sangha in times of persecution or to have averted disasters at the end of a Kalpa, ended warfare, brought rain in times of drought and turned back floods. Thus the acts were not simply a departure from the world, but an active involvement in it. Autocremation by Buddhists in traditional China was not a form of suicide protest for the most part. Generally speaking, autocremators did not burn themselves to draw attention to a political cause. If suicide protest is not the appropriate analytical model here, then what is? Self-immolation in medieval Chinese Buddhism was primarily understood to operate according to the mechanism of stimulus response or sympathetic resonance, Ganyin, a paradigm that was all pervasive in every aspect of medieval thought. As Bob Scharf writes, the notion of sympathetic resonance is deceptively simple. Objects belonging to the same class resonate with each other, just as do two identically tuned strings on a pair of zithers. The miracles that were said to occur before, after, and during acts of autocremation indicated that self-immolators were stimulating Gan, a response yin, from the cosmos. Self-immolation, far from being a disruptive force, as it seems to be in the context of modern globalized protest, was thus an act that was supremely in harmony with the universe in which medieval people lived. To think about self-immolation in the context of climate change, we need to bear in mind that this sympathetic resonance is thought to operate at several le levels simultaneously. First, within human society, interactions between inferior and superior social ranks are predicated on the idea that rulers should respond to the needs of the people. This aspect of sympathetic resonance may help us to understand why officials and rulers often treated self-immolators with such reverence in death by writing inscriptions for them, interring their relics, and bestowing posthumous titles on them. They could not afford to ignore or disparage the sincerity of their actions, lest they be seen to violate the cosmic and human order. <clears throat> 
Second, Ganyang determines the relationship between the human realm and the celestial. Human actions and emotions are thought to cause cosmic response and transformation. Acts which are the most sincere will cause the cosmos to respond in accordance with the, with the petitioner's intention. Abandoning the body in a selfless manner is the epitome of a sincere act. This particular aspect of sympathetic resonance is to the fore, is to the fore in accounts of Chinese Buddhist self immolators who burn themselves to bring rain, to end famine, or to mitigate other human disasters. And it would presumably be a key factor in any theory of Buddhist self immolation and climate change. Third, in Chinese Buddhism, the relationship between beings and the Buddha was often presented in the form of Ganyin. Buddhas and bodhisattvas are understood to be capable of assuming different forms and manifesting among humans in response to their needs. In some accounts of self-immolators, there are frequent suggestions and sometimes even overt declarations that a particular figure was in fact an advanced being who had manifested in order to teach the Dharma in a way appropriate for the age. Self-immolation as a Buddhist practice also offered a way of becoming a Buddha a response to the stimulus of the selfless gift of the body. Over the past 20 years or so, climate change has increasingly been seen as a factor in historical change in medieval China. How climate change was actually perceived by medieval people, especially as seen through the lens of religion, still remains understudied, as we already heard. In an important and groundbreaking article from 2007, Climate Change and Religious Response, the Case of Early Medieval China, T.H. Barrett, who just preceded me, suggested that a climate event in the mid sixth century may have fueled religious reflections on the fragility of the human condition and spurred an increased interest in eschatology from both Buddhist and Taoist quarters. This suggestion seems to be borne out if we look at trends in Buddhist autochromation across the same time period. A number of Buddhist autochromators in 6th century China seem to have been inspired in their actions by what they perceived to be new and urgent threats that their religion faced. These threats were not primarily related to state repression of Buddhism, but rather to larger eschatological fears that the religion was losing its potency and that the overall environment, both social and physical environment, was deteriorating. Such fears and a sense that in such dire circumstances new forms of Buddhist teachings were required inspired Sun Yai, a monk from a non-Chinese tribe in Sichuan, to burn himself publicly on the 15th day of the seventh month of Wuchang I of the Zhou Dynasty, September 2nd, 559. The choice of date was probably not accidental. It was the day of the so-called ghost festival since large crowds traditionally assembled at Buddhist monasteries to make offerings on that day, Sun Yai would have found a ready-made audience for his act. The choice of the ghost festival may also be related to Sun Yai's expressed intention to enter hell to suffer vicariously for all sentient beings. But if we examine Sun Yai's farewell speech, a rather more specific and eschatological vision is unveiled. At the end of the Kalpa, people are lightweight and sluggish and their minds become attenuated and weak. When they see images of the Buddha, they are just blocks of wood. And when they hear sutras, it's like the wind blowing through a horse's ear. Now, in order to inscribe the teachings of the Mahayana Sutras, I burn my hands and will destroy my body, since I wish them to respect the Buddha Dharma with faith. Sun Yai seems to have been suggesting here the need for exceptional direct action in a time when people's capacity to understand the Dharma through the normal means of images and texts was severely restricted. A specific moment in history probably made evident the urgency of this need, the fall of the pro-Buddhist Liang dynasty in the late 550s. In 553, Sichuan, formerly under Liang control, had been taken over by the Western Wei, actually a puppet regime run by the polity that would become the Northern Zhou dynasty in 557. Sun Yai may have had the sense that things were about to get a lot worse for Buddhism in China, since those rulers were less supportive of Buddhism. 
Similar beliefs, similar, similar beliefs articulated in a similar way at around the same time may be det detected in the career of the man known as Mahasattva Thu, about whom we just heard from Professor Farrell. He's remembered now as rather an unthreatening and benign figure, but the reality is probably somewhat different. In 548, during the disorder of a massive rebellion, Thu, who was regarded by many of his contemporaries as an incarnation, pre-incarnation of the Buddha Maitreya, vowed to burn himself as a living candle. Rather than allow him to do so, large numbers of his disciples burned themselves alive. Others burned off fingers, cut off their ears and fasted. They were convinced that the period of the counterfeit Dharma had come to an end and they wanted their leader to remain in the world in order to save sentient beings. In 555, the situation had not improved and the people were faced with constant warfare, banditry, disease and starvation. Fu appealed to his followers to offer their bodies in order to atone for the sins of sentient beings and pray for the coming of the Savior. Three more of his disciples burned themselves to death, making flaming lamps for themselves by hanging themselves from metal lantern flames. In 557, when the Liang dynasty was on its very last legs, Fu asked his disciples to burn off their fingers to invoke the Buddhas to save this world. In 587, long after Fu's death, in 569, one of his sons burned himself to death. One source claims that as many as 48 of Fu's followers burned themselves alive. We can see then that the fall of the Liang dynasty resulted in a veritable orgy of blood and fire, not just in Sichuan, but also in Zhejiang, where Fu and his devotees were based. Body burning was a consistent feature of the practice of Fu and his community, and their self-immolation had some doctrinal underpinnings related to Fu's identification with the future Buddha Maitreya. In 560, Fu claimed, I attained awakening 40 kalpas ago, but because Shakyamuni was able to perform the austerity of giving away his body, a reference to previous lives of, of Shakyamuni and specifically uh, his life as Prince Mahasattva, he was able to become a Buddha before me. Thus, he had impeccable grounds for cultivating this type of extreme practice to advance himself along the path to Buddhahood. Although the body burning actions were primarily devotional in theory, in practice they reinforced group identity around the figure of Mahasattva Fu. For the political disorder of the 550s and consequent religious panic which swept through South China may just have been a fairly local manifestation of a catastrophe which seems to have affected other parts of the world. Scholars have pointed to a systematic collapse which affected trade across much of Eurasia in the mid sixth century. David Keyes, for example, has suggested that a massive volcanic eruption in what is now Indonesia may have resulted in sudden and disastrous climactic change, the effects of which would have been hard to ignore in South China and may well have been attempt attended by crop failure, subsequent famine and disease, contributing to political instability. Whatever the causes for the deep sense of impending doom felt by Fu and his devotees, the situation for most people around the 550s and 60s must have appeared extremely bleak, especially if they remembered the much more prosperous, more civilized and safer days of the, re of the reign of Liang Wudi. Sun Yai's autocremation, on the other hand, was not presented as an act of despair, but rather as the herald of a radical new direction in Chinese Buddhist practice that seemed to offer a total renewal of the Dharma, witness the following remarkable statement attributed to him. He said to his attendant, after my extinction, it would be good to do homage to sick people. It's hard to fathom all their roots since many of them are Buddhas and sages who have temporarily transformed themselves in response to circumstances. If one does not have great equanimity of mind, how can one honor and respect them? This is true practice. Sun Yai promised that his autocremation would usher in a new age in which the bodhisattvas known through scripture would manifest among those who had previously been separated from them by time and space. As a lowly, illiterate barbarian himself who became known as Bodhisattva Sun Yai, this monk offered a potent example of this new dispensation. He seems to have had an attentive and appreciative audience to judge from the length of his biography, the number of miracle stories it contains, and other texts composed about him. Although Sun Yai was illiterate and a member of an ethnic minority, he, he garnered a significant following and not just among the uneducated masses. 
The leader of the post-mortem cult of Sun Yai was none other than the local governor, Yuan Zhao, a prince of the royal blood, who is depicted as personally handling and weeping over his relics. Also elite scholarly monks known to us from other sources not only attended Sun Yai's auto cremation, but also donated costly robes and staffs to ensure their karmic connections to the popular wonder worker. Sun Yai was remembered long after his auto cremation. He was the subject of a lengthy, independently circulating hagiography and a popular play called the Bodhisattva Sun Yai appears in the world in order to make the scriptures along with a song based upon it. We can see that self-immolators could be powerful cult figures and that self-immolation combined with millenarian ideas and imminent Buddhas and, Bodhis, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas was likely to be a potent political and social force. Aside from the sixth century wave of millenarian autocremation, we can see some other telling patterns in the practices of autocremators. Weather is not climate, but we should still consider the connection between autocremation and praying for rain. In 991, the empire was suffering from drought and plagues of locusts. When praying for rain failed to work, the emperor himself, Sung Taizong, vowed to burn himself alive. The next day, it rained and the locusts died. Here, the threat of autocremation was enough to produce a result, but sometimes it did not rain in time, and the vow was carried out so that the participant actually burned to death. Such acts did not remain the prerogative of the state. Buddhists also burned themselves in order to bring rain. In the year 1000, there was a great drought and two eminent Buddhist monks, Zhe Li and Fun Shi, performed repentance rites and vowed to burn, burn one hand as an offering to the Buddha. Before they could do so, there was a great downpour of rain. The Ming monk, Ming Xing, was expelled from his monastery as a novice for feeding a beggar, who then taught him how to pray for clear skies or for rain. In 1568, there was a severe drought. Ming Xing vowed that if it did not rain in three days, he would burn his body. A local official built an altar, put firewood on top, and ordered him to climb it. After three days, there was no sign of rain, and the official ordered that the fire be lit. When the fire was a few feet from the altar, the wind picked up and rain fell. Ming Xing unfortunately died and was cremated the following year. A monastery was founded to commemorate his offering and many high ranking officials came to the monastery to pray for rain in times of drought. These examples of burning the body to bring rain are not directly applicable to the topic of self-immolation and climate change, but they do show how the logic of using the body to bring a cosmic response was thought to work. The appeal was made directly to the heavens rather than being rooted through any human agency. What may we conclude from this brief survey? Suicide protest is likely to remain the dominant model for people using their own bodies to hi highlight the climate emergency. Self-immolation by Buddhists or the Buddhist adjacent in the context of climate change is likely continue to continue to take the form of suicide protest, although it may be inflected by aspects from the deeper history of Buddhist self-immolation. Although in pre-modern times, eschatological fears do seem to have driven at least one wave of self-immolation, eschatology has not yet featured very obviously in 21st century Buddhist self-immolation, but we should always remain alert for that possibility. Thank you for your kind attention.